In the second most populous state in the country, Texas, there's this weird mismatch between the 30 million citizens and their political leadership. The government is just solid deep red. Republicans hold majorities in both houses of the legislature. They control every statewide office and the state Supreme Court. And it's been this way for nearly 30 years. But the citizens of Texas are nowhere near as homogenous. In fact, the state is trending towards the Democrats to the left, shifting nearly eight points towards Democrats in just the past decade. And we have seen some close races, famously that Senate race in 2018 when Better O'Rourke came within three points of unseating Ted Cruz. But as of yet, that Democratic shift, and we've seen it at the presidential level, has not been big enough to change much of anything in Texas state politics. So elected Republicans in that state have long faced essentially zero political accountability. And that generally, as a general matter, leads to widespread corruption and misconduct. Let's take Republican State Representative Brian Slayton. Remember that guy? So-called family values conservative led the charge on anti-LGBTQ legislation describing drag performers as, quote, perverted adults. Well, an internal investigation just determined that 45-year-old Slayton had sex with his 19-year-old aide after getting her drunk. Now, to their credit, uh, after a solemn, sometimes angry and tearful recounting of Slayton's graphic and offensive behavior, the Texas House voted to expel him 147 to zero, making him the first member of the Texas legislature to be removed from office in nearly a century. It just gives you some of the idea of some of the characters who make up the Republican caucus in the Texas state ledge. It's quite a crew. Then you have the attorney general of Texas, Ken Paxton, who was just reelected to a third term after attempting to overturn the 2020 election, suing the Biden administration over and over, joining the effort to ban abortion medication. In his eight years in office, Paxton has faced multiple criminal investigations, including a 2015 indictment on felony securities fraud. In 2020, senior members of this guy's own office came forward, alleging he committed bribery, abuse of office, and other potential crimes. The Department of Justice is investigating those claims. Then some of those aides who came forward to blow the whistle were fired and subsequently filed a lawsuit alleging improper retaliation. Earlier this year, Paxton settled with the whistleblowers for $3.3 million, money he asked the legislature to give him out of taxpayer funds. And now these two Republican-led branches of Texas government have a beef that is exploding out into the open. The House, particularly the Speaker Dade Phelan, does not want to give Paxton that money. So they launched an investigation into the attorney general, accusing him of committing multiple crimes, including felonies at a hearing yesterday. Paxton immediately fired back, accusing Speaker Phelan of being drunk on the job and calling on him to resign. And again, to be fair to Paxton here, something did sound off the other day. Mr. Campbell, send that amendment. The amendment is acceptable to the author. Is there objection to the opposite amendment? And the chair has done the amendment. adopted. The chair recognizes Mr. Mr. Johnson of Harris. Mr. Johnson of Harris to speak in opposition to the bill. I don't know about that. <laughs> now, to top it all off, just hours after that hearing where investigators ordered Paxton to preserve documents and evidence related to the accusations against him, a literal dumpster fire broke out at his office. Paxton initially released this video referring to it as a case of arson. Today, he announced a suspect has been arrested with charge with criminal mischief and a preliminary investigation concluded the fire was accidental. But it looks like the House has the upper hand. The investigating committee just formally recommended that Ken Paxton be impeached for his potential crimes. If the impeachment is successful and one Democratic lawmaker says they do have enough votes, Paxton would be required to step down from his post temporarily while facing trial in the state Senate, which would mean maybe finally some accountability is coming for Ken Paxton and Texas Republicans. Today, South Carolina became the 21st state to have an abortion ban on the books after Republican Governor Henry McMaster signed a six-week abortion ban to law like the, like the one in Florida. Not only are conservatives trying to attack abortion access through state legislatures, they're going through the courts as well. An anonymous plaintiff backed by Texas Republican Attorney General Ken Paxton, the one that we just talked about, just sued Planned Parenthood for $1.8 billion with a B dollars. You will never guess in a millionaire's where this was filed. Which American city do you think they filed this anti-abortion lawsuit in? Ah, you guessed it. Amarillo, Texas. Ding, ding, ding. That's right. Amarillo's only federal judge 
Matthew Kaczmarek, the right-wing Trump-appointed judge who single-handedly struck down the FDA's approval of mifepristone, which had been safely on the market for over 20 years, that is the judge that will hear this new case. Alexis McGill Johnson is the CEO and president of Planned Parenthood Action Fund and Planned Parenthood Federation of America, and she joins me now. Um, it's good to have you in the program. I have to say, I saw the news of this lawsuit, and then when I read, when I read some of the details, I, I, I'll give an example from a Vox explainer here. Basically, they're suing Planned Parenthood for complying with a federal court order. That's the short version. The longer version. The Doe lawsuit alleges Planned Parenthood should have to repay all the money it received for providing care to Medicaid patients in Texas and Louisiana during the period those two states were legally bound to keep working with them. They claim that Planned Parenthood is liable for three times the amount of money it received, plus a penalty of up to $11,000 for each of the thousands of claims for payment filed with those two states. Um, how serious is this lawsuit, and does it pose a threat to your organization? Uh, well, Chris, yes, it's serious, right? Because yes, it is happening. Um, you know, again, in a uh, in a state and in a district that you know we have seen uh, has been hostile to reproductive freedom. So, so are we concerned? Absolutely. Is is there any merit to the case? Absolutely not. Exactly what you said, right? These are baseless claims. They are essentially suing for Planned Parenthood getting reimbursed for providing health care services in Texas to patients, just like every other health care provider does. And so, you know, we follow the law, you know, to a T. We ensure that we are compliant, we are a nonprofit, and millions of people depend on Planned Parenthood for their health care services. Um, but what is not, you know, clearly sufficient just to provide health care uh, for some of these folks is that they are hell-bent on trying to make sure that not only will they ban access to abortion, not only will they ban access to gender-affirming care, but they are hell-bent on also trying to shutter our doors. And so we are fighting it every step of the way because it is completely baseless. It is not true. Um, and, and honestly, um, you know, is a clear example of why we need court reform. Um, there, the, the case that also came out of the same district in uh, Matthew Kaczmarek in, in Amarillo, um, Mifepristone, this was a, you know, a credible, uh, <laughs> audacious injunction nationwide that he'd ordered for that to be taken off the uh, taken off the shelves, Supreme Court ultimately stepping in and stopping that. But that case has now gone up to the appellate level in the Fifth Circuit in Texas, which is notoriously probably the most uh, conservative. And it seems like the conservative judges on that are pretty open to some of the arguments on Mephipristone. Like, how is Planned Parenthood gaming out the fact that this is likely going to go to the Supreme Court? And the ability and viability of it on store shelves is not completely clear. Well, look, we believe that Mifepristone will be available for the foreseeable future, um, but you were absolutely right. Again, that's why I ended my point on the need for court reform. When you can forum shop in district in, uh, in northern Texas in order to secure one judge who has you know, um, indicated, um, you know, and, and clearly in, in his own opinion indicated that he did not believe that the FDA had done proper due diligence on on, on um, Mifepristone, which we know is safe and effective after 23 years and 5 million patients and, you know, being available in 60 countries, that it now goes to a conservative uh, Trump appointed largely judges at the Fifth Circuit and then all the way up to the Supreme Court. So our reproductive freedoms, not just in, in states like Texas and Nebraska and South Carolina, are under attack, but it is one a case that could have implications for the entire country. This court capture is the thing that is most threatening to uh, to women in this country, and that's where you know we that's the message that we need to get out so people understand it's not just in the banned states, the 21 banned states, nearly half the country. This is an attack that is coming to you, um, you know, right now. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me very clear, I, I think it was clear uh, after Dobbs, that th they're going to keep doing everything they can until it's, born, it's banned everywhere all over the nation completely. I mean, is that your expectation of what the ultimate vision here is that you're working against? Yeah, I believe that they, they were never real about returning the, the power to the states, right? They, they 
came out during the leak time, right? I think the day that the leak happened, they announced, the opposition announced that they wanted a nationwide ban. Every uh, Republican candidate is now being queried as a litmus test on where they stand on a nationwide ban. Uh, and we know that the fear of the nationwide ban is what is mobilizing people. That is why you saw what you saw in, uh, in, the, in the midterm elections. That's why you saw what you saw in Kansas right before that and in Wisconsin right after. And so, you know, we need to ensure that people both have access to care, but also understand that every vote they take up and down the ballot is going to be a vote related to this care, um, because you have folks who clearly need ethics uh, reform holding all of these offices from attorney general to the to the state Supreme Court to, to lawmakers. And that that's obviously incredibly concerning. Yeah, one of those one of those fights happening in Ohio, we spotlighted yesterday in which they've now inserted a ballot amendment in August to raise the threshold to 60 percent to stop a majority of Ohioans who they suspect would vote for abortion rights from being able to do that. So there's going to be a pre-vote in August, just one of the many fights on this uh, front. Alexis McGill-Johnson, thank you very much for your time tonight. Thanks, Chris.